in the right place. This is the Eat Fluencer Podcast, and I'm your host, Dr. Maggie Landis. Together, we are going to unpack everything about eating and discover the what, when, and how that will let you lead your best life. This is not your doctor's conversation about nutrition. Today is when you can start to love eating again. Let food be food and you be you. Get ready to get eat fluenced. Hello and welcome back to the Eat Fluencer podcast. I'm Maggie Landis. I'm so glad you've joined me here today to listen. I'm really looking forward to this episode a lot. This is, um, this is a good one. Of course, I think my podcast is good, but there are certain episodes that I feel a little more attached to than others. And I think this is one you'll be happy you stuck around for. This is episode 55 and it's called grieving the thin ideal. So first, just to introduce myself, if you're new here, uh, I'm a physician and a public health nutritionist, and I now work Uh, almost exclusively in the anti-diet wellness space as an educator, a group coach, and uh, just, you know, really amplifying this message that we don't have to subscribe to diet culture, that your body size is not under your control, and that your pursuit of weight loss does not give you moral virtue, um, even though that's what our society tells us. So I do a lot of discussion about mindset work related to leaving diet culture, uh, the kind of body acceptance journey, really liberating us from the toxic diet culture belief system, which has infiltrated our media, our healthcare profession, the fitness industry, the food industry. It's just everywhere. And my mission is to help listeners like you, uh, particularly women, really who I think have the biggest targets on their back, um, realize that the things we have been conditioned to believe for years and decades might actually not be fact. Um, And that's what I like to kind of debunk and work through um, using all the best evidence I can find on this podcast. So I'm happy you're here today. And make sure you come back next week too. My podcast drops a new episode every Wednesday. And next Wednesday's episode, which will be episode 56, is my first birthday episode. Um, it's going to be a fun one. What I'm, I'm doing a ask me anything type format, and I've been soliciting questions out of my private Facebook group. Um, My goal is to answer 20 questions in 20 minutes next week. Some of them are related to this anti-diet work. Some are personal questions. Some are professional questions. Some are questions about having a podcast. Um, Anyway, it should be interesting. I probably won't be able to answer 20 questions in 20 minutes, but um, (laughs) I will do my best. Um, So today, let's let's get into this conversation. What is grieving the thin ideal really mean? Um, Well, you know, it's kind of twofold. To me, it's grieving this belief system that we have all subscribed to where thin is better. It's better in every way, according to our Western culture. It's, It's healthier. I'm doing lots of heavy air quotes today. It's healthier. It's more favorable, it's more attractive, it's more um, suitable for navigating our environment. It's just overall preferred. And we have to let go of that in order to fully become liberated people. And uh, it's a grief process. The other thing that we're grieving simultaneously with this ideal is the idea of what we were going to be like in the future. We're sort of, um, you know, this vision of when you finally find the right diet, when you finally lose weight, that future you with this magically happy life and all the problems solved, we have to say goodbye to that future person because that future person 
in that form may not exist. And going through this exercise is really a required part of body acceptance and becoming separated and totally uh, disengaged from diet culture. And it allows us to enable this version of ourselves where we have peace in our body now, where we can uh, support our needs now, where we can evolve our thinking and um, enable this higher level of self-esteem and this better version of ourselves now. And it doesn't depend on meeting that cultural ideal, you know, thin body. But like I said, it's grief. We, if you're my age and you have subscribed to this belief system, this cultural construct for decades, this has been our constant companion. It's been the focus of lots of time and energy. And, you know, when we let it go, it really is grieving. There's really not another word for that. And I want you to know I'm not comparing the loss of the thin ideal or the loss of the future self that doesn't exist to the loss of an actual human being. I'm not that ignorant. I don't believe that those losses are even on the same magnitude of scale. But the idea of this podcast is that the psychology of it is the same. The way we move through that separation really follows the same path whether it's an idea or a person or a future version of you that you're having to say goodbye to. So that's, that's where we're going to go through this today. And, um, you know, most of you have probably heard of uh, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross's Five Stages of Grief. She was a um, Swiss psychiatrist who came up with this model of grief back in the, I believe the 60s, um, she did a lot of work with terminally ill patients and this really was about death and dying. In fact, that was the name of her book, On Death and Dying. But, you know, the the way she has these five stages, um, we can apply this to our grief with the thin ideal But we have to make note, as she did in her work, that they're not linear. Um, They generally happen in this order, these stages of grief, but they don't have to specifically happen in this order. Some people um, don't go through all the stages. Some people skip a, a stage or go back to another stage Um, You may only go through one stage. Many, many people go through all five. But the idea is not that it's a, a rule book or an absolute truth. The idea is that these are, um, in her research, the five commonalities that are observed in grieving people. So she's got the five stages and um, it's denial anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. You've probably heard those, but our conversation today, we're going to go through how we can apply this and, and recognize where we're at and what we can do to continue to make progress when we are uh, leaving diet culture, trying to accept our bodies, Um, And come to terms with the fact that many of the things we have been promised and told over the years are simply not attainable and frankly not true. So let's start here. Denial. And I think this goes without saying. This is the stage where you just are not even in reality. You still are clinging to this alternative ending, this preferable reality that you have envisioned. 
So, you know, in diet culture terms, this is where we look back and remember the good things that our relationship with dieting has given us. And we think about maybe when we did have a success with weight loss, maybe when we did feel collegiality with other people pursuing weight loss, where we um, maybe even made new friends or new relationships, picked up new hobbies in the pursuit of weight loss. Like we, in the denial stage, you're sort of unwilling to look at reality and what the likely end point or likely outcome is. You still have a um, skewed view of what's going on. So, you know, you hear this statistic that, you know, 93, 95% of weight loss diets will fail over the course of two to five years, but you don't hear that. What you hear is, there might be a 5% chance that I could lose weight and keep it off. You know, that's where denial is. The problem is 100% of the people are thinking that. And we can't obviously all be, you know, it's sort of the the 1 in 20. You're sure that you're the 1 in 20 and not the 19 in 20. Um, But even if you're a robust gambler and you're willing to gamble on a 5% chance that we've talked about this before, you know, the people who do lose weight on weight loss focused diets, many of them, I think the word success is, you know, not necessarily true because they may have really had to give up a lot in their lives to do that. It may be, um, an unhealthy relationship with food an unhealthy body image, that got them to that, quote, successful weight loss. So, you know, a lot of those people go on to have disordered eating and even some full-fledged eating disorders as well as anxiety disorders and things like that, binge eating episodes. So, you know, I wouldn't put all your eggs in the 5% basket, honestly, because I don't even think that's success. But denying the reality helps us pace our feelings because we, we really know, like we're smart. We know you've done diets, 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 and you know that if they worked, you would already be where you think you're going now. Um, you know, but saying goodbye to that future version of yourself and all the fantastical happiness and the wonderful life that goes with it, Um, that's really challenging to let go of because, you know, there's this little temptation to do just one more, just one more. You're going to be the success story if you just do it one more time. And we know objectively the next time is not going to be any different than all the other times. Um, but we're not comfortable accepting the fact that We're not the exception to the rule. We are the rule. The rule is the body works and you are not going to outwit, outplay, outsmart it. Um, But we don't let ourselves recognize that and accept that. We are still in this denial place. A lot of that comes from also the fact that we were astonished and shocked that We've spent so much time, effort, money, energy trying to lose weight because it almost, we feel a little gullible. Like there's no way that all of these things can fail me, but everybody's thinking that everybody's saying that there is not one more secret diet that you haven't found. If there, you know, we would have found it by now. We would all know. We would have shared the information. We would all have done it. So, um, but that's where the denial piece really comes in. So what can we do? And by the way, I'm going to tell you that as we go through these five stages, I'm going to offer just a quick suggestion of like an activity, a, a reframe that might help you move out of this stage. But 
you know, for the denial, the best thing I think is to just read the evidence and educate yourself. This is where these books that I recommend, um, the health at every size books, anti-diet book, the intuitive eating book, um, you know, unapologetic eating, all these books that have lots of references that are very grounded in scientific evidence. This is where it's like a really hardcore reality check. And I think, um, breaks a lot of that denial. Okay. Anger. We all understand anger. And I would bet maybe a lot of you listening to my podcast and following my social media are at this stage because you do realize diets don't work because otherwise you'd probably be following some diet influencer instead of me. But, you know, you, you do realize you're not in denial. You've put on that objective, more rational set of glasses to scrutinize the evidence um, and realize that there's not something that you've missed. All right. There's not that one hanging out there that you have to keep looking for. But, you know, you think back on how much of your life was spent pursuing this false ideal. How deceptive all the marketing is. And, you know, you might be mad at yourself even that you fell for it, that you didn't ask the right questions, that you didn't figure this out sooner. Angry um, can, ang anger can represent what you gave up in order to pursue weight loss. You might have missed social events. You might have, you know, not eaten wedding cake at your sister's wedding because you were on some no sugar diet. I mean, there's things you missed that you can't get back that you might be very disappointed and angry about. You could be angry at other people, at your friends who validated your disordered dieting behavior, at your parents who taught you to diet, who introduced you to food rules, to medical professionals that judged you on your body size and won't listen. Um, you know, the fashion industry, the fitness industry, social media, you can, this whole belief system that you can control your appearance and you should control it. And um, now that you realize it's not in your control, the more you see other people continuing to advocate for thinness, it's infuriating. But you've got to lean into this because if you don't feel your anger, you won't get past it. I mean, I'm no therapist or psychologist, but repressed anger is not a great emotion. So sometimes this is a real challenging one to move through because the threat is ongoing and the source of our grief is still out there and it's still this thin ideal is still the culturally normative belief system. It's still what we see um, in the media. It's still what we see everywhere. It's still what everybody's talking about. So uh, it's challenging because it's not something that happened that you're working through. It is like you are constantly working against it. And that by itself is, is anger inducing. But the more you allow yourself to feel it and give yourself space to be angry, you'll start healing. It will start dissipating and, you know, de-intensifying. Um, there are other emotions we have to get to and anger is like a wall that blocks us from getting to the other emotions. So. It's, it does give us structure and a focus because we can be angry at something or someone. Um, and that does feel maybe a little more productive than the denial stage where there's just this sort of vacuous space and no attachment. Um, but 
we need to honor ourselves and experience the anger. And if you're in my community, that is a great place to be. There is lots and lots of women who are in this stage. And what I tell them every time, all the time, is it's okay to be angry at anything but yourself. This is not your fault. You didn't get here. You didn't invent diet culture. You were literally born into this way of thinking, which is a false belief system. So things you can do um, at this stage is, you know, a lot of people like writing. um, And whether that's something you keep private or something you put publicly like a blog post or social media, you know, that's up to you how you process and sort of purvey that. But it's not your fault. And that is the key piece to remember. Talk to other people, um, you know, get involved if you are so inclined to be an active voice in this space to help other women kind of rescue themselves from diet culture, the people that are still in the unawareness stage, um, you can help them. You can help anybody that you're a couple of steps ahead of, but, um, this is a normal part, the anger. What comes next? So what follows anger is bargaining. And this often goes hand in hand with guilt because you feel like you might not have tried hard enough. I'm doing air quotes or all this like, if only, you know, if I would have gotten up earlier to, to make a gym routine, if I would have prepped my meals, if I would have shopped at a different store, um, if I would have done such and such, I'd have more money. And then I could, you know, buy the diet plan that I know must be better. I, um, you know, if I could have just, you know, kept my body in check when I was younger and was already thin, then I wouldn't have gained weight. I wouldn't have aged. I wouldn't be in this situation. And we want so badly to negotiate this. We are so desperate to hang on to the thin future version of ourselves. We are willing to make major life changes to um, try one last time to get towards that state, to be in the place that we've always desired to be. So we bargain, we bargain big. Sometimes it's, you know, truly delusional thinking that if, if I can just be on the diet that works, I will, you know, be a better boss. I will never um, argue with my employees. I will be a better parent. I'll be a more compassionate spouse. I'll never complain about my kids being messy. I'll never, um, never desire a nicer house. I'll never overspend money on clothes, whatever, whatever it is, you know, some people even will, um, you know, negotiate. And I don't know who we're negotiating with as a side note, because we're sort of just negotiating with this in this no man's land, but like, it's okay if I could just, I have, I have heard people that truly have wished on themselves, like, please just have an illness that makes me lose weight And then once I've lost weight, I'll get treated and I'll be better or whatever. And that is crazy, crazy. Um, We're willing to give up our whole entire lives to try to be thin. But the interesting thing is that, you know, really this whole pursuit just deflects the energy from doing the real work we need to do. You know, if we have issues with our kids or our employees or our spouse or this or whatever struggles, look back at the, you know, thinnest version of yourself in the past. Did you have a perfect life? Was everything 
rosy and happy all the time and no no problems befell you? Of course not. Because these things are independent. You know, it's in our head that we believe when we are finally thin, the other problems will go away or the other problems will be much easier to deal with. Um, but that's just simply not true. We, we do a lot of bargaining because we don't want to accept we, our bodies might not shrink and we will negotiate anything to not have to accept that we really remain in a um, kind of stuck belief system just wanting one more go at it and you know a real typical example is um, when people start learning about intuitive eating they they hear how it works it makes sense and when they see the science that supports the outcomes they get it but they still have this bargaining where I'll just go lose some weight on the diets like I know how I have been able to do and then I'll intuitively eat but that's not what intuitive eating is and it's not a weight loss technique or a weight management technique it it is a way of thinking and if you're still thinking you can diet to lose weight and then that's the entry point for an intuitive eating um you're not really thinking in an intuitive eating framework now so what advice do i have for this bargaining phase well you know continue to learn we're we're never going to stop learning Um, Keep reminding yourself of this science about pursuing weight loss and permanent weight loss. Um, But this is the point where conversations really happen. And it is usually quite a bit of help at this point for you to get involved in a community, whether that's a Facebook group, whether that's a coaching group, whether that's pursuing work with an individual a counselor or therapist or dietitian or somebody working in this space, but to talk out some of those negotiations so that the other party can help you come back to reality. That's, that is a really helpful place sometimes at this point. Okay. And moving on depression. And this is not depression like, depression ICD-10 depression that's just the word um I mean it's related I guess but it's not I'm not talking about necessarily having a diagnosis of clinical depression I'm talking about this empty feeling and if we imagine this whole process being like tug of war you know the bargaining phase is the pulling on the rope and pulling, 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 and just trying hard one more time. The depression is when you finally just let go of the rope. And it feels a lot of times like there's not a way out. Like once you've let go of the rope, then what? Um, But understanding that empty feeling, that loss is part of this because dieting and this pursuit of the thin ideal was our constant companion you know it kept it kept us occupied for most of us for most of our lives even it may still be keeping you occupied it gave us cultural standing and dieting and the pursuit of weight loss was this yellow brick road, honestly, that we constantly aspired to and always came back to because it was going to lead us to everything we want in life. And when you realize there is no yellow brick road for you going towards a thin body, everything may just seem too overwhelming, particularly when you still see Uh, diet culture in your face all the time. I mean, this is when the before and after pictures 
are very um, triggering sometimes or people that are constantly talking about what they're eating. You just want to withdraw. It's too much. It's too overwhelming. You feel hopeless and detached. It can be sadness. It can be kind of this blank space. Um, Sometimes just a withdrawal from thinking about this stuff at all because what's the point, right? If you're, if you can't get to that future, you know, version of you, why bother? Why even do any work? Why worry about your self image? Who cares? Like who cares about your health? Like, you know, to hell with it. Let it all go. Like, why do we even need to talk about food? Why are we, you know, paying attention? I'm never going to be the way that I need to want to should be. Um, And you're not only grieving the loss of that future version of you that's, you know, might not materialize, but you're grieving all the people and activities and environments that were connected to diet culture and all the things that surrounded you on this journey so far. So it's normal to feel really disoriented and detached and directionless and, you know, what do I do? Now, the key piece here is letting yourself feel it and not looking at it like something that needs to be fixed. Intuitive eating is a helpful structure. Um, and in my coaching program and in my you know group, when I talk about it, it sometimes fills this void so that you don't feel so disoriented. But that doesn't take away the feelings. That doesn't replace the feelings. The key here is to give yourself space to feel the sadness about that first, that future version of you that doesn't exist. We've all had losses like this in other aspects of our lives. And it's, you so clearly picture that future thing happening. And then in an instant when you realize that's not it anymore because you didn't make the team, you didn't get the job, you didn't get into the college, you, your boyfriend didn't propose, you know, you have a hysterectomy and realize you're not going to have kids the way you wanted. Whatever it is, it's, it's all in the same vein because it's okay to be sad that that future vision is gone. But... The work here happens when you're able to start looking at opportunities and when you're out of the grips of that thin ideal and that you're not um, aligned and totally committed to that future version of you that you've been working towards, you realize you have this blank slate instead of just a blank space where you're free falling and detached and disoriented, it's really a blank slate and you get to decide what you want to do, how you want to grow, what uh, work you need to do internally and the external world becomes less and less uh, important. You really can start focusing on the things you have control over, which is just yourself and less energies are being sort of wasted on these external things that you don't have control over. So again, what to do in this uh, space is find a community that can support this work you're doing, share your thoughts, give yourself space. Um, And if you feel like there's not going to be a way out of this and you can't even conceive of happiness outside of thinness, this might be the step where you look to other people for inspiration and find other body liberated women on social media or read books or reach out to them in real life and find those, you know, I hate to use the word body positive because that's taken so out of context, but more body liberated role models who will be inspiration to you. And then finally, acceptance. You know, you can sort of bounce around in and out of all these stages, hoping that ultimately you land on an acceptance and can stay there. 
And the confusing part is that people think this means you're okay with it, meaning that, you know, you love your body right now, you're totally satisfied. Um, That's not what acceptance in this lens really means. What it means is that you recognize that there's a new reality and the vision you had of your future is probably permanently not a reality. You, it doesn't mean you have to love it, but you have to accept it. You have to live with it and it becomes the new normal. So, you know, reorganizing the way you think about stuff. This is where you can start taking on new things. But most of this whole process is letting go. I mean, it's, it's recognizing where we got this thin ideal, realizing how fantastical and, you know, false it is and letting go and feeling those feelings. But when you finally get to the acceptance, it is just um, building back up the things that you need to continue to support your body acceptance moving forward. Because we're always going to continue to evolve and you need to have new connections, new meaningful relationships, a new level of understanding. You're going to change and grow over time and you want to continue to learn and be supported as you evolve. So, you know, this takes time. This is not like a, a day's work. <laughs> we're talking, you know, we're not talking about grieving a actual person. We're talking about grieving the idea of a future version of us. Um, and in some ways that's easier in some ways that's more challenging, but the good part is that we are still here. You can still continuously day after day, hour after hour, decide to honor yourself and your needs and respect yourself. Okay. That's, that's really, um, what we're talking about here is working through, Uh, these concepts of intuitive eating and health at every size is really learning to trust your body and deliberately rejecting diet culture over and over and, and intentionally um, speaking out and bucking up against this thin ideal and rejecting it. You know, this is how we, regain our power and we no longer are oppressed by the cultural ideal. So you're going to, um, move through this, like back and forth through all these stages. I do others that have been doing this work for a very long time do It is constant effort because we are still up against diet culture all the time. That's the problem is that the, the trigger, the nidus, the, the instigator, um, that tosses us back and forth between these thoughts is not gone yet. It's still very present in our environment. So in that regard, it's, it is even more of an ongoing process than perhaps a one-time event. And, Here's what I know you're thinking, because this is what women ask me all the time in my Facebook group um, and in my coaching is like, does this mean if I'm willing to do this work and go through this grief process that I have to be this size forever? Or like, am I going to continue to just get bigger and bigger? You know, because some people, when they start intuitive eating and leave diet culture behind, if they have been dieting themselves to a unnaturally low weight, they will probably, um, you know, rebound somewhat to their set point weight. Um, it, it just feels for a lot of people like they are giving up and giving in because we're still attached to this 
idea that thinness is favorable and it's in our control and you should control it. And I'm not saying you'll never lose weight. I'm, I'm not against weight loss at all, but I'm against the pursuit and the reverence for weight loss. You may lose weight. You may gain weight. You may stay the same weight. It's when you really truly uncouple your belief system from your weight, it doesn't even matter. The point of the non-diet approach to nutrition is to direct your efforts to things that are within your control. And you have to lay aside, bury, grieve, detach this, um, you know, admiration for the future thin self that you believe you can create by dieting. Because any future version of yourself will never be enough if you don't start thinking you're enough right now. And that sounds like it should be on a, you know, Hallmark card or a screensaver or something. But I really believe this is true. You know, people argue all the time this kind of chicken and the egg arrangement, you know, well, first I'll get thin, then I'll be happy. No, no, no. Then first I'll get, you know, happy, then I'll be thin. It's, I don't believe either of those are true. I don't think they're intertwined like that. They don't have to be. You have the choice to pursue self-respect and peace and joy in your life right now or not. You know, there are certain things you get to pick and the good news, those are them. Picking the size of your pants, not them. So just understand that this is work, this is a process, and we're doing this together. It is ongoing and requires like ongoing work, um, but it gets easier and I don't want you to feel uh, totally deflated that you're having to give up. You're not giving up. You are redirecting your energy in a productive way that's going to ultimately serve you and your health and truthfully all aspects of your life. So hopefully that uh, landed well with you today. I'm very glad uh, that you joined me and stuck through this a uh, little bit longer episode, but it was worth it was worth talking about. If you have more questions, please let me know if you are a woman who's wanting to learn more of these things and get out of diet culture, um, send me a message or email me at hello at maggielandismd.com and I will send you an invitation to my free weight inclusive haze aligned Facebook group. I'd love to have you there. But always looking forward to continuing this conversation every Wednesday. Next Wednesday, October 27th will be my first birthday episode when the Eat Fluencer podcast turns one. So you'll want to join that one. It's going to be a lot of fun and I'm happy you were here today. Until next time. Thank you so much for being here today. If you love what you've learned, follow me on social media at Maggie Landis MD and you'll never miss a thing. You can also check out my website at maggielandismd.com and sign up to be part of our community of eaters. Thanks again for stopping by. We'll talk again soon.